Welcome back to Alex Academy. This is chapter two of Traditions and Encounters, written by Jerry Bentley. So chapter two really talks about early societies in Southwest Asia and the Indo-European migration, and this is really important to like the early development of cities and human beings around the world. So the first thing is the quest for order. So as we talked about in the last video, we talked about Mesopotamia, which is the land between the rivers, and it's basically the land between the valleys. Of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, of course, these are located in modern-day Iraq and Syria, and this place, like much of it is still today, really had little rain. It was sort of like desert, but it was more fertile back then, so it needed irrigation. So there was some small-scale irrigation going on by 6,000 BC, and of course, with irrigation, it was needed for farming practices. So food supplies eventually increased with the advent of agriculture. And so, sort of like the first city, sort of Sumer in the south, began, and it became a really big population center as many people started to live there. So once the first city started to emerge, you had government institutions start to rise up. So these governments would sponsor building projects and irrigation, and it would also sort of start things such as building a wall or having a military to sort of protect the people within the confines of the government. And finally, you had kingships evolve and noble families. So basically, some people started taking more power. Back in the day, everyone was mostly equal, but now you had kings who started taking more power over other people. So one of the first, I guess, kings you could say was Sargon of Akkad. He's from 2370 to 2315 BC. And you don't need to really memorize the dates, but he's just a good guy to know because he's sort of like the first king-ish. So he had a coup against the king, and eventually he was able to take control of the king of Kish's land. But eventually he was corrupt, and his empire weakened, and eventually it collapsed. And then right after him. In sort of around the same area was a dude named Hammurabi, and Hammurabi is super important. You have to know him. Basically, he was the ruler of Babylonia one, and it was basically Babylon as we know it today. And he created this law code, which was a law of retribution and importance of social status. Basically, it was eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Basically, if you did something wrong, it would have to come back and bite you as well. So this code is really revolutionary and influenced many law codes that were to follow. Right afterwards, you had the Assyrians who were in northern Mesopotamia, and these were really vicious people. They had a really powerful army, and they used new stuff such as chariots, which weren't available before with the advent of the wheel, and iron weapons, which were much more sturdy compared to the old kinds. Also, you had the new Babylonian Empire. So this was Babylonia too, and you had the king Nebuchadnezzar, and this dude he really sort of wasted some money. So like he created a garden, a palace to show his wealth and luxury, and he wasn't always that popular. Throughout this time, we had really important economic specialization and trade, and there were really some new and existing technologies that really broke through in this period. So you had bronze, which is made from copper and tin. And that was sort of the most commonly used things in weapons and tools for agriculture. But then iron, around 1000 BC, became cheaper and more widely available. So then it started replacing bronze in weapons and tools. You also had the wheel, which really helped trade, and carts and chariots. It could really just move things a lot easier and faster. And then you had shipbuilding, which started. Of course, you could now travel between ocean lanes and different places across the ocean. So it was really good. Although it wasn't like big scale, like Pacific or Atlantic Ocean travel, that would come hundreds of years later. Also, you had a stratified patriarchal society. So, like of course, as the social classes we talked earlier, you had the kings who were at the top, and then priests and priestesses right under them. Then you had the commoners who were really just peasants, but at least they were free. And then you had the slaves, which were owned by other people. And also, you had like patriarchy. So ever since the advent of agriculture, men started taking. A much bigger power in families, and men really thought they were superior. And you would see this rise of patriarchy as history progresses. And even today, society is highly patriarchal. So that's a really important thing to understand. Patriarchy really begins to take off after agriculture. 
And then you had writing traditions finally being written down. So this is like the earliest history we have of these people because it was actually written down. You had like cuneiform, which was the Mesopotamian writing style. Basically, they would write on clay tablets and then they would bake them. And then with this, you had education. So some people would train to be scribes or government officials instead of maybe just farmers. And then you also had literature. So like epics such as Gilgamesh really started to appear. And we still read some of those today. Then you had Hebrews, Israelites, and Jews. These were like another group in the Mesopotamia area. And these were originally pastoral nomads, and they traveled a lot. They went from Egypt to Palestine, back to Egypt, Palestine to Jerusalem, and they got conquered by the Syrians eventually, which led to them getting kicked out of their homeland in Jerusalem. And this is really the start of Judaism and, of course, the other Abrahamic religions. So this is really t important to understand. So just go ahead and read this part on your own. Also, you have the Phoenicians. This is just nice to know because, of course, number three here, they really invented the early alphabetic script in 1500 BC. So our alphabet actually comes from this. So we owe a lot to them. And these people, they weren't really farmers. They were ag they were traders. So they traded a lot and that was basically their main job. And finally you have the Indo-European migrations. Basically Indo-Europeans were this family, language family, and they really originated from the central steppes of Asia. And they were pastoral people. Then one day, I guess, or over hundreds of years, they started spreading out and they just branched out from Central Asia. And then they took with them all sorts of different variations of their languages. But most importantly, when they traveled, they were able to domesticate horses, which really helped facilitate the transportation systems of the time because they could really travel a lot faster than other people could. Also, one group was like the Hittites, and they s settled in central Anatolia, which is basically today like Turkey. And they really, as I said before, they had new technology that was revolutionary. The light horse-drawn chariots with the spokes in the wheels and iron metallurgy, which of course the Assyrians used later on. And so really they spread out everywhere. They went to Central Asia, East Asia, they went to Europe. And, but the common thing was they all spoke related languages and worshiped similar deities. So they were really just similar altogether. And today, the majority of world languages actually come from the Indo-European group. Pretty amazing, right? And the last wave ended in Iran and India, which the people call themselves Aryans, which thousands of years later, Hitler himself mistakenly classified him as Aryan. But that's a story for another day. So this has been Chapter 2, Early Societies in Southwest Asia and the Indo-European Migration. I hope this was helpful and hope to see you in the next video.